Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Pod Packa. Today is a Pod Packa first because today we are going to have not one guest, but two guests in the same episode. Today, we have a couple of special guests who can say that they have been in Wapaka in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. And these two have known each other for the last 20 years. They are both retirees and are both very involved in the community. So please welcome to Pod Packa, Marge Ritt and Betty Stewart. Good morning. Hi. Welcome, ladies. Good morning. Why did you decide to come to Wapaka? You want to go first? No, you're going first. Oh. <laughs> well, we came home from the military and uh, <clears throat> came to Wapaka because there was a farm here that we were going to work at. And we did. <laughs> For 12 years, we worked at a nonprofit farm <laughs> trying to pay off some cattle. And the milk prices weren't good then either. And, and it, it didn't go. <laughs> We worked at it and worked at it for years, but uh, the farming didn't go at all. Why did you come here, March? Oh, I graduated from college in 1970, and um, I needed a job, and I had a, a lower elementary degree for teaching, and the summer was going by, July, and in August, I got a phone call <laughs> to have um, interview for a teaching job in Amherst and actually mm. my dad drove with me to the interview because I hadn't been north I hadn't I didn't know where Amherst was and the man there told me I would have some Amish children <clears throat> and uh, and within the community and he sent me home again without, you know, I'll let you know, he said, if I had a job there. And the very next day, I got a phone call and they had a job opening in Wapaka. And so I came by myself that day. My father was a farmer, he was busy. So I drove up to Wapaka and I met, um, with a principal and he hired me. They needed a job for a schoolhouse in rural. Oh, and, but so anyway, I went home that day because they hired me on the spot. They said, well, you have a job here and it would mm. be second grade. <clears throat> and so my, um, I'm gonna tell you a few humorous things today. Okay. And it's just a little off the wall, but that's, kind of who That's I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was back, like I said, in the 70s. And I have, that was called Golden Hill School. And since yeah. th they have closed all those schools that they had another one called Barton, I know. And another one was called Guards Corners. And they did, I only spent one year teaching there. But I do have, um, kind of an antidote. I can tell that one sure. about the going out there um, in the fall. Um, in the morning on the radio, I heard that the president of France had died. And so I kind of had that in the back of my mind. And <clears throat> when it got to be 11 o'clock that that very day, the principal came out to the school and he opened up my schoolroom door and the third grade door. And we also had fourth grade up in an upper level. And he brought a bugler with him that day and he played taps. And hmm. so then, then they left. So then I wrote on the board, De Gaulle, I had wrote that. And I told the kids that that was the reason that the bugler had came out there. <laughs> so I had lunch with the third grade teacher at noon and uh, she commented to me, she said, oh, it looks like you're really current. She says, you've written 
de Gaulle on the blackboard. And I says, yeah, I told the kids that that's why they played taps. And she goes, oh my dear, no. She got like this horrible look on her face and she, and she said, no, no. She said, it's Armistice Day today. That's why they came out and played taps. <laughs> and, and so then she also said to me, um, you're going to have to tell the children. She goes, oh, you know. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, yeah. I have a quick question. That was interesting. If you wouldn't, yeah. if, if you wouldn't mind explaining <clears throat> to uh, what Armistice Day is. Oh, uh, well, now it's called Veterans viewers, Day. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Explain, maybe explain that because a lot of our viewers are younger and they may not. Right. Yeah. Know now we call it is. Veterans Day. It's on the 12th of November. Yeah. It's a day set aside for honoring the fallen and and all veterans i think yeah. it's not just necessarily yeah. you have a little something to explain to the kids but the teacher got mixed yeah. up. <laughs> i was just a rookie you know it's my first year teaching and and now i don't even know um how much they do in schools with that i they, yeah. don't think so i'm sure out at king they do because you would know yeah, yeah. No, you know, so that's that's interesting to me because uh, <clears throat> a name change. Uh, Some holidays have had name changes as exactly, and, and uh, it's interesting because, like I said, a lot of our viewerships actually. What do you say, Joe? Under thirty? Yeah, we have a lot of forty and under. Uh, probably about seventy percent. Uh, we're yeah, trying to get more older people to uh, watch and listen to the podcast. I do. I would like to get in contact with Bethany. Uh, or the senior center because I feel like there's so many people that uh, are interested and want to listen to it but maybe they don't know how or they haven't listened to a podcast before some haven't listened to a watched a YouTube video before so it's it's somewhat new to people so it, it would be really cool to have more, yeah to have uh, you go out people. there and talk to them and and bring it up like it was an event you know people like to mm -hmm. have an event and maybe you get tired of bingo and you want to hear something new what do they think we always want to do bingo we might want to hear something <laughs> different you know <laughs> is that the only event they have or something like that you know <clears throat> we're talking about veterans mm -hmm. um our farm didn't make any progress we were a nonprofit organization <laughs> Couldn't pay for the cows very well. Milk wasn't bringing us much. Then we'd set aside the uh, better stuff for butter and all that that would come from some of the jerseys. Well, anyway, during this time, we realized how broke we were. Betty better get out and get some money. <laughs> so <clears throat> I applied at the veterans home. Well, they had nothing open. And I thought, oh, that would be really good. Well, then my refrigerator died out couple of, two years later and all of a sudden the commandant came out to the farm on long lake and asked for me there i was in my old dungarees did i want a job and i go well yeah i applied out at king about two years ago and they didn't need anybody and they said well we now have a doctor that doesn't want to use any dictating machine i'm not talking in any any machine he said I want someone that can do steno. You go out and find somebody. Well, they must have looked at my application and I had done steno work and I took those classes in school. And he said, you come out to King and you'll be hired. Because what, what is steno? It's the shorthand. shorthand. You know, like I would say happy okay. birthday. And then I, the person would say happy birthday and I would write it in shorthand real quick and he'd go on and on. And what he did was, take the physicals and he would dictate it to me and I would have to write it down right away. Legs, no sign of edema, blah, blah, blah. And he would go through all of that. And I thought, oh my gosh, I thought the first day I was going to quit. I ran in the bathroom and I could hardly breathe and it was just awful. <laughs> my first job and I had to do it right away. You know, there was no practice like uh, letters they did in school, Dear Harry, about some shipment of goods. And here was this doctor dictating to me <laughs> in uh, medical terms. And was he, was, was he okay? Was he good to work with or was he a general? I guess so. They kept me on. <laughs> 
And then I had to go to my desk and type it up right then. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was. Yeah, I want I want to backtrack a little bit with you, ladies. Um, you're both you both are transplants in Wapaka, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Where Where are you originally from? Um, I grew up in Oshkosh. Okay. And went to a one room school, and then um, the university at Oshkosh. And I grew up and was raised in Chicago and suburbs. And uh, I went to high school. When I graduated, we had 990 graduated. So wow. the school was just huge. Sure, for your freshman year, and that kind of fizzles down a little bit and a little bit, but we still graduated with 990. What suburb are you from? In Maywood. Chicago? I was in Maywood when I graduated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maywood, Illinois, where the racetracks used to be. Okay. And now there are two high schools there, what they call East and West. Okay. But from there, when we went into the service, we went to Montgomery, Alabama. And that was a very new thing that happened there. Politically, we had a change occurring and I was there during the George Wallace governorship. Oh. And Jesse Jackson. Mm -hmm. Well, then we came back into what we came into Wapaka, tried our thing at the farm that didn't work. And then I landed at the veterans home. And that was in 64 when I was hired. And I stayed there through many changes and many buildings were demolished. Mm -hmm. Some people, and I think we have postcards at the at the Holly Center of the Fairchild, mm -hmm. the Marston building where they used to all go to lunch. If you could get up and walk, you would go <laughs> there for lunch. And um, the OV Center was the medical center where, where the doctor was and where I worked. And they also demolished what was the Burns Clemens was a... Um, um, kind of like assisted living building. <clears throat> and that okay. was right in front of the lake too. Okay. What happened at the OV center was after it was a medical building and that cleared out into those four story nursing home buildings, it became the um, homeless veterans shelter. And they came from all over Wisconsin to be rehabilitated whether drug problems, drinking problems, health problems, homelessness. And many times, March and I didn't know each other right then, but it came later that we began to meet because we both worked at the food pantry and Red Cross. And that was when you could bring food into people in the homeless shelter. Nobody thought anything much of Oh, what germs there were. We covered up the food and took it over to the homeless veterans in the OV building. And they were glad to get it. Yes, they, would they were. Just meet us at the door. They mm -hmm. were so happy to get bread and desserts. Desserts, yeah, desserts that were left over from Red Cross. We'd bring it over there, drop it off, say hi. And I have pictures of us uh, bringing stuff, and the men would just grabbed the donuts and cupcakes and they were eating right then at the doorway. They tore that down just yeah, recently. That, that yeah. building was torn down for their new building, which I believe is going to be called uh, the Moses building. Is okay. that right, Moses? And uh, well, that's the change there where you don't bring in food. Yeah. People aren't welcome to uh, bring anything in, you know, and you want to be friends with the people. They came from all over. They served our country, and we wanted to help take care of them. Well, I mean, how long have they not allowed you to bring food in? Is this just a pandemic thing, or was it well before? No, it was. We did that until they moved, moved and closed down the building, and all the veterans were, um, <clears throat> what do I say, transferred to their hometowns. Mm. And, and we didn't know anything more about them. They went to their hometown or someplace where they re maybe had relatives. 
and um, they try to find jobs for yeah, some they, of them. Yeah. And, and I know Mike Kirk at our depot, when I say our, it's referring to the historical society. <clears throat> but Mike, Mike Kirk told us once that he had some people, uh, men that were willing to work. Yeah. And they'd come whenever he had kind of a bigger job. And Mike said they were good workers and everything too, but you know that it's just a day, something for one day or a couple of days. And they did have cars and, <laughs> and they were looking to the community for help. Mm -hmm. and, and we were able to do that then. About what years was this or decade? Was this? When we took food out there? Or oh 15, yeah, maybe 15 early, years ago. Early, or that, yeah. Maybe. maybe. 10 to 15 years ago. The building was closed for many, many years. Okay. They so that, the that's away. pretty recent then. Yeah, yes, it really was. Okay. And, and it was torn down along the time the Burns Clemens building was torn down. But sometimes you think about it and we felt kind of bad that they were shifted over to their, you know, Madison. Well, you thought, well, where is that man going to get help in Madison? Such a big place. You wondered how they would make out, you know, because you didn't hear very pleasant things about Chicago, Madison, Racine. And these people were not locally helped anymore. I often wondered if they thrived. And we knew one man that my daughter would often have him come for the holidays to eat. And he really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And this man died alone in his little home, all alone. And I wonder how many of our veterans did not have that proximity with local people coming in and being able to say, hi, how are you doing over there? You know, and, and here's some goodies that we, we used at the Red Cross. When you go to a place like Racine, how are you received when you have served our country and now you're brought to a big city. Maybe they what, thrived all right, but you often wondered if they what did. Was the, what was the reasoning for shutting things like that down? The building was old. It yeah, probably the building was got, old. Yeah. But they didn't want to put money into it, I mm -mm. think. Mm -mm. You know, it was mm -hmm. shelter, food, breakfast, lunch, and supper, and a little bit of training and help them get out to Wapaka and find a job if they could what happened at their home life, we didn't know. And some of them came into town and worked. You didn't know who they were when they were hired, but you felt good as a community helping out. And then that just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that was never brought into Wapaka again. Everything was, you know, assisted living, but not the kind of thing where you knew our veterans were there and looking for some help. I won't get on my soapbox about how I feel about that sort of thing because it, it will take up the rest of the show. But uh, this episode is presented by Northern Kitchen. Northern Kitchen is a brand new store that is in Lucky Tree's family of stores on Main Street in downtown Opaca. This new kitchen store is on the corner in the last block on North Main Street. It looks fantastic in there. You have to see it to believe it. My mom, Michelle Drake, has been working really hard on this store. It looks great in there. There are lots of great kitchen gadgets that you cannot find anywhere else in the area. Make sure to shop at Northern Kitchen on Main Street in Wapaka. So we were kind of what in the 70s by then. Right. When I, I still was offered to teach, but they, uh, they changed my room. And I was supposed to be in a church because they had more students than they had room for. And so some people were at Trinity Lutheran Church in their Sunday school classrooms. Some went to St. Mary's um, Church and taught. There were at least two classrooms there. And I got um, relocated to the Methodist Church. And I was upstairs in the upper part where their Sunday schools are, where their rooms are, <clears throat> and another third grade teacher was next to me. And the one, I have a humorous story about being in the church, was the fact that there could be a funeral scheduled there on a day when we had school. 
And so the kids, you know, kids will be kids. There was a, a hallway and on second floor, and there was also a door that opened up on the other side that was the <clears throat> choir loft. And you could see right directly down into the church proper, right smack into where a casket would be placed. No. And the open, my little second graders would see that. They'd look directly down. And of course, they'd tell each other, you know, did you see the casket? You know, and, and so it might have been my imagination, but I thought they were a little better behaved on funeral days <laughs> because I had to say, um, I don't want them running in the halls or I don't want them to be loud. And, you know, they'd be working they'd be we're taking a test or they'd be quiet and we'd hear the organ and we'd hear the soloist mm -hmm. and they'd be super you know, kind of like scared almost you know and then they would have questions and so it was kind of a, a you know for me as a teacher it was like they maybe hadn't experienced a death in their family and mm -hmm. some of them are only seven years old and perhaps, you know, grandma or grandpa had passed away, but it, it was a teaching moment too, because then they'd want, you know, they'd ask about death, you know? And so anyway, um, after the Methodist church, I um, got married after um, that. And I did some substitute teaching. They moved me again two years after that. I was downtown in a school on School Street. And now those classrooms became the district office offices. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So um, I had you know good years there after those two years. So that made five total. They asked me to sign up again and be, have a contract again, but I didn't because I was starting our family and I didn't have, I kind of tried to think about things that happened in those years. I was happy. I had some really nice kids and what happens to when you are a teacher, you really do become a big part of the community and my husband taught a total of 40 years oh. I only taught <clears throat> five total not counting my sub years but he was seventh grade social studies and he was a coach for um, sixth and seventh grade both girls and boys basketball you meet a lot of people and um, right now, I have a daughter who's also <laughs> a teacher, one of my daughters, oh. and she's actually in the same room that he taught in. So that makes oh. it kind of neat. Yeah, it makes it kind of full circle. And you really feel a part of the community. Not, I mean, and some people, they see you out and they know me, you know, just because they knew Don or things too. Mm -hmm. and, but it's nice. It's nice to have that recognition. And I can be shopping, like I can be in Lucky Tree or something. And somebody will, you know, oh, you're Mrs. Ritt, you know, and, and they'll even have their son with them that day or something. And then their son had my husband for a teacher. And they'll recall some little incident at playing basketball or that, you know, and I, I, it's, it's agreed. Not everybody gets gets along, you know. They they wouldn't have maybe liked him as a teacher, but in general, they did. Yeah, you know, and in it's general, it's a big part I, of your childhood. You personally never taught at the current elementary school, middle school, or high school, but your husband did. Yeah, he was middle school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the at the current locations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, where was the building you were in before the building on school street before school street we were in the churches we all the 
ele a lot of elementary, there was an overflow and we were in churches. There, there was Westwood School and Riverside School too. Those were elementaries. And that was in Wapaka? Yep. I didn't know there were multiple elementary schools in Wapaka. Other than, oh, I know there's the chain and learning center now, but before. Yeah, that. Riverside School is where the hospital is now. I think the hospital bought it. And Westwood. And Westwood is, is a now church. a church. I, I don't know the name of it, Yeah, but it's a church. They had a lot of kids in there. That was mm -hmm. full too. Westwood. What street could I tell you that's on? Union. Union. Okay. At the end of Union, it's almost the end. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> kind of like behind the parking lot of Neville's, you know, there's a little street that goes in the back and down to the power yeah. station. There was a school on that road and that was full. And, and that's cool. That is a, that's still there, that building as a church now. And yep. then the Riverside Elementary School, that's now the hospital. I'm assuming that was torn down for the hospital. No, it's no, still there. I, they use it for a training center, you know, like they have programs and things cool. in there. It okay. belongs to the clinic, but we don't go in there. I think it's a training session. Maybe they have a films or something in there, or new trainings, yeah. I wanted to tell you something more about the Veterans Home. Yep. I was there almost 39 years, and I want to tell you something, and maybe some people that are new to Wapaka and King don't know. During the time when I was working there in the maybe mid-70s, we had a strike out there. Oh, no Most way. Three nurses, but some other areas, you know, some other departments, and, and um, I recall that a lot because mm -hmm. I think it was, oh no, it was uh, near 85, 86. And uh, of course we were working for insurance. We were working for money. We were working because of many reasons. And here came a strike. Well, we didn't even know they were fighting about anything. I guess it was mostly pay and uh, other benefits. So things came to a head and it wasn't settled and we had a lot of medical people in the ov building and uh, other buildings and as a strike is okay you have a factory you just shut down the machines well there we were with people that are disabled in the nursing home and many of them were in really bad shape where they and they were in bed all day and nurses had to take care of them so the nurses and everybody else management did not agree and we had a strike. I don't think it lasted more than two weeks. I don't recall all that time. Um, and it was not pleasant. There were people at the gates hoping you would not come in, hoping you would not go to work. Maybe you parked somewhere else and you looked like you were going to support the, the strikers, but you wanted to walk in and keep your job and help the people. Well, I was working in the medical clinic with the doctor and uh, we had two or three doctors then and they would take care of everybody. You hardly ever went anywhere unless you went for cataract surgery, you'd go to Stevens Point. You got all your care at King. You didn't go every day to Wapaka. Neither did the Wapaka doctors come to King. The doctors were hired and stayed in King. They took care of the people day in and day out. Well, okay, so then there's a strike. Well, that means who's gonna take care of the people that were laying in bed? So we had to call families and tell them, uh, your father's being sent to Bethany. Your mother's going to a place in New London. There's a bed there. We're having this, this you know, disagreement. We're having a strike and they're in bed all the time, as you know, and need care. So the ambulance and the, um, Medical vehicles are taking your loved one to some other place, but don't worry, they'll be in touch with you also. And so this happened, I think it was 85. I don't know if anybody remembers about this strike. It wasn't, it wasn't an inanimate subject like a machinery or we want more money for this or that. 
These were people that needed to be cared for. Look how many people we were short to take care of during COVID and here was a strike where the, they were not coming in. Well, maybe the guy had to do something at the water plant and maybe he had to do something in the kitchen and the ladies had to cook. And I can't tell you, I don't remember what areas also was, were striking, but the hardest part and the only part I knew because I had to help make the calls to the families that your father and your uncle were being um, transported to another nursing home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the over the course of the time you've been here, what sort of uh, gotten, you know, in your opinion, better? Because uh, uh, you know, Wapaka certainly has a lot of a lot of charm. Mm -hmm. uh, right. As opposed, and I'm only, you know, I can only reference my personal experience, and I've lived in a number of small communities, and uh, I do find Wapaka to be definitely by far my favorite. More um, intimate. Yeah. By having organizations start like right. Mar March and I joined the Wapaka Women's Club. And then. Uh, well, that's recent that yeah. you got me to join that. But the Women's Club is an old, way over 100 years old. Even. Right. They have pictures of the beginning of that at the Holly Center. And um, I probably joined when I retired from King in 01. I was looking for something to do. How am I going to be busy? I'm not used to this not having much to do because I worked in this area for 39 years, but I never had time to get out. You know, I was busy raising family um, and working full time. I never had any time off. Uh, when you had a, a child, you had your six weeks and they were looking for you to come back to work <laughs> right away. That was it. Most of the times I saved my vacation time and then came back to work as soon as I could. But I decided, yeah, I think I'm going to join the Wapaka Women's Group. And uh, what they are, it was started back on those women decided they wanted a library in town. And so that was the beginning of the Carnegie Library because they got it so that this money was granted. There was a lot of Carnegie libraries built in even, other places, even just in Wisconsin, but in a lot of other places, because he had a lot of money. And mm -hmm. so they were real instrumental in getting that building on getting it built. It used to be, I think, a small little library above the post office or something or that location where the post office is now. Yeah. And we and, didn't have a library as such. So now what do we have? Maybe eight members at the most yes. that are still this club, women's club. We're trying to keep it going. <laughs> yes. It originated, it was called the Wap uh, no, Women's Federated, Federated, I know that word was okay. in there, Federated okay. Club. Then it was changed to the Monday Night Club. And we still have some ladies in Wapaka that remember the Monday Night Club. And it would be all oh, the doctors, wives, and people in, in business. And with something like, do you think I could ever join something like that? I was just always working. And so I wanted to join something. And I was welcomed. A school teacher, Mrs. Mortensen, welcomed me into the Wapaka Women's Club. And I thought, gee, me? I, they were, said I should come in and join them. And I like that. You like being asked if you have some time, would you like to serve the community? And I thought, well, yes, sure. And so later was that- this, Was this associated with the League of Women Voters as well? I don't think no, so. I don't no, I think don't think so. It's just generate general federated women's group. A lot of them were college people. Well, I, I didn't finish at a college. I just did my medical training to become medical records you know but even today we do it's a service it's servicing your community right and betty is our treasurer right yeah and well, what's the name of the group now then wapaka women's group club <laughs> yeah very small yeah here. but you but, know i mean we're i'm curious about it because i heard something the other day mm -hmm. about a group of of uh, a group of women that were getting together 
to form a, a, a Wapaka women's group. I don't think they realize there still is one. Yeah, yeah, that would be good to hang on to some of those people if I could get their names. We're always looking for extras. And, I, I know uh, who they are. I will tell them. Uh, yeah. I, I honestly believe they don't. They don't. They, they don't, they don't know. know. We don't have here. enough money, but we like to do things for, um, like the food pantry. We always give something to the food pantry near the holiday, and sometimes it's. Uh, Paper products. 20, yeah, it's paper products, which they cannot buy. The food pantry can only buy Food. foods that you eat. So if you can get them something like toilet paper, napkins, boxes of Kleenex, we do that. One, and then we gave to Foundations for Living, I think, too. Yes. We gave socks. They yeah. said they needed socks. So someone went and bought from our little fund of money yeah we don't have much yeah. but we gave it all to the foundations for living they said they wanted hats and socks brand new this touches on the subject that i asked about earlier about all these like subgroups and everything and i think this is what happens you got people interested in forming groups that don't realize those groups already exist yeah, <laughs> yeah we'd like to hear about these people because we we go out to a lunch to have our meeting because a lot of the people are alone and it's a good time to get them out in the early day, you know, instead of evening programs, we have a little bit of dues and we spend it all on foundations for living or something to the food pantry. We'll ask, what do you need? And as she, she always tells us, the director will say paper products, anything like that. What do you ladies think about uh, uh, how downtown is now? I mean, it, it had been wide. Uh, I, well, they must have paved and done stuff to cover up the old trolley rails because uh, they had to dig those up when they redid everything. But I was told some of the, the infrastructure under the, the roads and stuff in town were well over 100 years old. So it's been a while since anybody's done any upkeep, mm -hmm. you know, right. other than patchwork, I guess. But how do you think, what's your opinion of how it turned out? Well, March and I both remember a little grocery store on the side of where the library is, you know, across the street. I don't know if there's a financial investment place there now, but there used to be a little grocery store. And where the food pantry is now, there was a, a grocery store and it had a, a butcher and a lot of nice things. And you personally could go in there and ask for something, you know, something that you needed for Friday night or Sunday's dinner. And he, he served you. Nowadays, you don't really see a butcher much. You know, somebody well, comes out, and brings the food and lays it out, and he doesn't know anything about you. And all you want is a small piece of meat instead of this great big thing that looks like half a pig. And you say, <laughs> but, but I just want a, a, little, a little roast. And, and this piece of meat is about 16 inches, 20 inches long. Well, this isn't the kind of shopping that I could do. Well, there, there's Nemus. You can, that's. Yeah, yeah, that's it too. They're still going I, and operating. Yeah, what I mean, I love Nemus. You can go in and get whatever you need. Yeah, oh, yeah. I remember. I, just getting back to um, this, the street and what they did um, recently, I'm shirt tail related to the fellow that did the sculpture. Um, uh huh. Oh yeah, the waving and the waving something, and Luke Ochterberg <clears throat> is the man who did the work. You know, some people even without knowing that I'm related to him, you know, they'll give a comment. But I do like it. It's kind of growing on me, and I like it. And I think it added to the the atmosphere. And I thought it was going to be placed a little farther down, like maybe more by the park in the Dean's home. Mm. But, um, I've had some relatives come and we've had our picture taken there now. And he's a famous guy, the, the sculpture, that, the man. No, I, I, I like that sculpture. I yeah, do. it's beautiful. It's very telling of Wapaka, you know, or you think Wapaka is all just seasonal summer. It really isn't. There's a lot of wonderful things happening during the winter. 
and oh, you yeah. could be lonesome to get out and it's good for you to find out that there are groups that really want you to come in now we just don't play cards and things like that we're looking for somebody who wants to serve the community that's why i liked it here because i thought gee they want me to come to this or that that's kind of nice because it isn't um big town stuff you know women could come in and and help do the littlest thing and and you feel like you're doing something like we work for the red cross or something and and they're happy to have us gee whiz and we're putting in our time down there and they welcomed us to come in and we make sand we made yeah, sandwiches but before we, covid we would yeah. make the sandwiches you really feel like you were partaking of something the people come in and now they blood. don't give sandwiches to the ones that are giving blood i think they just are happy with a bottle of water maybe yeah and... they give them a bag of potato chips oh, and okay. something like that but this is all because of covid but yeah we used to make the sandwiches and we talk to them and sit make down sure with them they weren't going to pass out after giving blood yeah you like stuff. to visit with people that are giving blood we would sit alongside them and talk and some of them you know are giving gallons <laughs> and uh and you know who's coming in you feel like you uh have something to offer them a little chatter while they're there. Well, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit if I can too with the current sure. building. Um, I was looking for a job after my teaching days were done and the library was where the Holly Center is now on Main Street and it housed adult books upstairs and a children's section downstairs. Well, in moving, they needed to have every book that was there onto a system that would no longer be card catalog. If people <laughs> remember what a card catalog was, if you oh yeah, wrote, you go through a tickler like that subject, and and then it would tell you where to go to find it, each book had a number. Well, they hired, they got a grant of money and hired me because, okay, well, I have this little card here right now, but you would take that card and the name of the book is on a centralized system on the internet. And then it had a corresponding number and so I had to use a microfiche machine and it would swirl and find the author. And then you would find that book. And then you would write the guy. My job was to write that corresponding number down to go into a, the big system so that all other libraries know we have this particular book. So it was kind of a hard job with the looking at that machine for they only let me do it four hours at a time and i would spin that machine until i found the name of the book i was looking for and then i'd be done and another lady um, mary Jo, would uh, type them all in at the end of the day and then they got put onto what was called the owls system mm -hmm. and that is then they wanted that all all the books done before they moved everything to our brand new library that time and I don't know what year it was but we got it done and it all and then they even had kids moving that time the books were they had wagons oh. and the children helped and they moved them all and oh into gosh. the new library and it was a big deal to get I think they had a moving van for the, you big know, items yeah. yeah but they even had a thing about kids could help but we never had a, the big library that they have now so that's a big change for from when we were here I took my kids always to the lower level yes. to go to the library that was a big thing and I worked there a bit as well besides the microfiche machine I think I practically lost my eyesight because that machine just, if you've ever looked something up on one of those, it just flips twirls really fast. fast. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, now, now the library has 
many different grants and many things that the library had went to the new library when they didn't have money to buy something. And now it's coming back to the Holly Center. They're sending <clears throat> some of those glass cases back to the Holly Center because they bought something newer or whatever. And then a podium comes over to the Holly Center that was at the library and things are coming back to the Holly Center <laughs> that we had, we had given them for the library and, and there wasn't any library at the Holly Center anymore. It was kind of closed and quiet and nothing was happening. So now the furnishings are coming back to the building. Actually, after the library left, the building became a restaurant for a year or two. It was called yeah, Carnegie's. In the basement. And some people remember that, that it was... It only it lasted nice about a year. It, yeah, and they had desserts there and simple foods, and it was a good idea. It was a real good idea, but then, you know, econ economically, it didn't yeah, it fly. Was, no, not really. So, But you know what? When I was taking some of my training in the medical field, I went to Oshkosh, and I didn't know anything about Oshkosh. It was scary driving into, I mean, they didn't have all the roundabouts, but still, you know, I'm coming from Wapaka after all those years, I go to Oshkosh, UW. No, I didn't want to be there. I went to Stevens Point because I had to see how their medical rooms looked, you know, the medical records room. And I had to take some training in Stevens Point. Well, it wasn't big then in the seventies, but I still didn't want to be there came back to Wapaka and stayed there. This is where I wanted to be. I felt comfortable. No, I didn't want to go into the big towns anymore. And I sure wouldn't want to now. I like my well, small. Where Betty lives is beautiful. I mean, it's by the Red Mill there. And you can see why you liked it. Yeah, because but it's... I like to be in a smaller town too. It seems like most places you're welcomed. If I go into Oshkosh, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, what am I doing and here? People told me that when I first was going to work here, they said, Wapaka, that's God's country. They had heard that as a, have you ever? Yeah. They describe it. I mean, we have the chain of lakes and things here too, you know, and, and the county seat and everything. So it's where things are happening here. <laughs> But you do, you live in um, paradise. You know, I think that Red Mill area, it is just a gorgeous place. And I do I have some uh, quick questions with all the stuff you talked about. How long did it take to go from the card system at the library to put everything on the internet? Because that must have taken forever, especially when the internet was first out. I, well, I know it probably took well over a year because, you know, I talked about it was a job I got, but the other people who worked there, any in their spare time, they would take the cards too and do that and try to get it done but so oh i'd say well over a year maybe even two years that they realized i think that was when they asked for the grant because they said you know we need some some help with this yeah and i'm assuming that was in the 90s mm -hmm. early 90s probably i don't think late 80s and also were you excited about the internet being this big new thing happening or were you hesitant about it I was excited about it I did I liked that idea um you know and the kids could play their games and things too we bought a few of the games I have a Commodore yet do you know what a Commodore is no, no. I don't know what that is oh, it's the first one of the first computers you're shaking your head Tim oh, wow yeah and I, I still have it. And that's when they played Pac-Man and things on this oh, Commodore. No. That was the run. Of, and <laughs> yeah. And my son-in-law, he's gotten excited about the fact that I still have this. He said, why do you, you know, why do you still have that? And he says, well, it's an antique and things. And someday I might sell it. But it was one of the first, I, we bought one of the, from Sears, I think. 
And it was one of the first computers, but. You know, talking about correlating words, medical records years ago, before I ever got into it in early uh, 60s, late 60s, early 70s, when I took, finished my training, they were called librarians, the medical record person, and it was paper, 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 you know, boxes of paper about somebody's history. Us women would have been called librarians. Then they took the new name, just medical records, it went into that. Mm -hmm. Then there was another name when I finished and I got my plaque and everything was called health information tech yes tech you yes. were registered or maybe unregistered because you hadn't finished but we started out with the word librarian for your medical records on all this paper did you have to transfer medical records at the veterans home uh and onto the internet just kind of like how marge had to transfer library no. records at first i was just typing them yes i did and then after that um, they brought computers in. That was our first work yeah. in computer, not just home, you know. It was work in King, and I was at MacArthur Hall, and the records were put on internet, and the nurse in another building would write something down, like, uh, say the word was tonsillitis or something, and then she would tell me that the record is open, and I would have to use the code for tonsillitis or something more lasting, like late effects of polio. Some people, the veterans had that, late effects of polio. And then she would say, okay, it's open. <clears throat> and then I would put in the code for late effects of polio. And then it would close maybe for the day or two days until she'd tell me to put something else in it, like uh, hearing loss due to explosions in the war or something like that. And then she'd tell me to put that down. Mm -hmm. And, and it would, she would open up the record. She's in another building with this person. And then we would write that down. And that was before Medicare came and Medicaid came to the Wisconsin Veterans Home. That's why they encouraged me to go to school. The doctor I worked for said, you better go for that because Medicare is going to require your job to be filled by a medical records person. And so I thought, well, yeah, I better do that. I want to keep my job. And so then I went and took this uh, training, but it was going to be required by Medicare and Medicaid. You just couldn't come and pay your way and give your uh, social security check or whatever. And also the Medicare people were starting to come in and look at things and nobody ever came before, you know, look and see you know, how the bed looks and how the paperwork looks and all of that. Medicare was coming in to check everything. And this was something that was needed. Well, the computer age hit us like a bomb, actually, because we weren't trained from kinder kindergarten on, you know. No, no. <laughs> they teach them the keyboard. All I did was type on a typewriter, and now suddenly I had to have this computer put in my room mm -hmm. <clears throat> and a nurse across the street tell me what to do, and I had to do something by computer. I did a little writing for the um, Hutchinson House, which is a museum on the end of Main Street. It's at the very end on South Main. Can't miss it, but um, we've work there now too, because Betty has done a lot there. I started in 1997, writing what was called the Hutchinson House Highlights. And every week in the summer, I wrote a little article and it um, broadcasted, you might say, where it was and what some of the things inside held. Um, just, you know, I'd focus on the lace book or something, or. I think we need that again. Because <laughs> people yeah. come there and they live in Wapaka and they said, we've never been here. What is this in here? Like they'll go to Fallorama. I've never been here. And we say how long we've been open and everything. And they live in Wapaka and never knew that the Hutchison house was there. 
Who I, lived here? Why is this house like this? I was real proud of, you know, my job doing that. And I never really lacked for a subject to say, what am I going to do next? And there would be events too that we'd have. And so then I could write about those and invite people for that. And um, what are, for a computer, what we were saying to kind of, not to segue, but to, I would personally take my article to where the newspaper office was. I didn't, I don't know, I, I didn't, I would type it and I would print it and then I would take it over there. But I think now it, you just send, you know, yeah. it could just go on. They don't have time to meet you. I don't and... think I knew about sending something. I don't know if that was, but each week I'd have to personally take it to the desk. I'm glad they're starting the uh, um, veterans cottage, you know, the King Cottage. Yeah. To tell them a little bit more about the cottage and what they had, because now you don't see any cottages out at King. No. You just see these big buildings and you think, oh, well, you know, great big four story building. There's more to is, the story there. Isn't uh, that the last cottage left or are there more? Uh, there is one there beside the chapel that okay. was the original. And this was brought to somebody's home. And I think we got it from her, not directly from the Wisconsin Veterans Home, but you don't see any cottages. And that's the story of how the veterans came with their spouses and lived in a little cabin. Mm -hmm. And they didn't eat in there. There was no cooking. And now those are all gone. So it's good that we will be able to open up the one. The commandant's house is still standing, which I wonder, because it's so big and probably yeah. needs a new roof for something. Yeah, to... <laughs> it's, it's pretty old and, and there's nothing going on in it that I know of. <clears throat> and you know where that is located, the, what I'm talking about, the, com no. the commandant's house? Yeah, right? it's, it's between the new parking lot and the new building st and Stordock Hall and the Marden, and it faces the water. It's right down almost at the, uh, what it, is the waterfront. Yeah, and it has a big wraparound porch, and it has some Tourette's, I think, too. Yeah, it's, it, it, was very, it was a very beautiful. Did you go inside? When I had did. There was a few times when they asked the public to go inside, and I did. It's a beautiful building. It had a lot of history, but nothing is going on. And I'm a little afraid someday probably will go down and they'll want to put another four-story building in there. Um, they don't use it either, do no, they? No, they don't it's use all it for anything. Up. You know, the, there were a few stores in town that disappeared and I remember the one it was called the Atkinson store and I bet you don't yeah. have what they had at Atkinson they had a basket that flew from one side like I'd be here and I'd hand the uh, sales lady my five dollars and she didn't put it in the cash register it would go up in the basket across the ceiling mm -hmm. and up to somebody upstairs and yeah, they that's, get that's, you where the northern, that's where northern home is now Yes. yes, the change would come down in the basket and then you'd get the uh, change back. I remember going in there and shopping. Wasn't, wasn't that there was everything there, but there was something for the women and something for babyhood. And then I remember the first suit my husband had to buy when he was in town. He went to, what was the name of the men's store? We actually had an actual hey, men's bugs. Hey, Biggs, right. And um, you would be able to buy a shirt for your husband, a tie, didn't have to go online. He could come in and check the suit. How did it fit? Is it long enough here? Does it all right when I button it up and everything? And, and somebody right there would um, fix the cuffs. Is it too long? Is it too short? Somebody right there would do the mending and you would get the pants back all ready for your tall husband to wear right in Wapaka, a tailor. Can you imagine that? And does I remember- hay, Does Haybags wear, uh, is in Northern Home as well, right? No, no, Haybags, that's, no, that's, what, the, two doors that's Lucky Tree. 
Okay, because there's a men's and women's clothing store that both used to be in Northern Home, and you can tell which side of Northern Home was the men's store and which okay, side was yeah. the women's store because yeah, that was you go that in and you look at the ceiling of Northern Home, you can see that the men's side is just plain lines on the curbs of the ceiling and on the women's side it's a more floral pattern i believe but there's an obvious difference on the ceiling of what what is mm -hmm. the men's side and what is the women's side at northern homes well, I, have to look. I never looked up there but it was in, so nice to have a place where you could have all that done in town well in the, yeah in lucky tree that's where haybugs was but in the back of Lucky Tree and in the basement, all the shelving still has all the shoe sizes and pant and clothing sizes on it, oh. where they, you know, had their inventory. Lord, wow. Um, uh -huh. And that's where, you know, at the Historical Society, they have that big display they put out every year for Arrow shirts. It's a Valentine's thing. That was actually in the basement of uh, what's now Lucky Tree. I was down there in the one of the shelves down there was like half as thick as the rest. And I thought, well, that was odd. So, you know, I, I pulled it off to look at it. And it was that real thick cardboard and it had never been opened. It was a display for Arrow shirts sent, oh. sent to from New York to Haybugs wow. for, uh, you know, the uh, Halloween promotion or sorry, Valentine's Day promotion. Okay. And uh, I did a little research on it, and uh, it was designed by a, a, a prominent artist at Disney for the Arrow Shirt Company. Wow. And, you know, so, it, it, you know, I, I thought it was really cool. I donated it over to the Historical Society, and they, they bring it up every year. The thing's massive. It's pretty big. <laughs> but, yeah, the old Arrow Shirts, you know, is, uh, I, I can't... You know, it had the, you know, the old, it kind of reminded me of the old uh, Valentine's Day artwork. You know, they have a heart with the arrow going through it, you know, like Cupid and all that nonsense. But they uh, made ladies' clothes too, arrow did. I had some yeah. arrow ladies' blouses. <laughs> but, no, it's fascinating. There's all these old uh, shoe, uh, shoe shine boxes and things like that downstairs. Uh -huh. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've always wondered what's in some of these basements around here. <laughs> Uh, there's a sub basement in the big building on the corner. It's, it's a financial person. Yes, that's and that used to be the shoemaker. Well, it was Holly sure. Funeral and Caskets too. Oh, I didn't know that. Bammel? I... Bammel's? No, it was no, Holly Funeral and Caskets okay. for the longest time. Uh, this the building I'm I'm referencing. It had the, one of the first buildings to have an elevator in it in this area. Because you know they had to take the bodies up and down, okay. but okay. Uh, when they dug, when they got down there and they found the sub basement, they were finding things like old bathtubs with the big claw feet buried underneath. Oh. I was, I, I just wonder what's under some of these buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, tell. right across from that, on the corner where you could drive down to the park, you know, when you turn left and go down alongside the fireside building, then you can drive yeah. down to the park. Right on that corner there was what we would call the shoemaker store. And oh. later in life, when there wasn't a lot of shoes to be repaired, he would repair purses, you know, like your leather purse broke and you could take it in there and he'd have this big machine he could sew the purse strap on. And I used to take my kids as um, snowmobile suits and big his jackets. Wife, his wife would fix the yeah, zipper. You'd yeah. have the zipper fixed. You'd take yeah. it over there and she'd put this real thick zipper in that never broke again. And she'd, <laughs> she'd sew them in. So you got things repaired. And I don't know if there's anything in town that you can get repaired anymore or even get a pair of pants fixed up for your husband or cups mm. or anything. But you that was available. To, yeah. Jerry Burnson. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was available yeah. at Hey, big. That is, that is one thing we are definitely lacking. It's uh, guys' clothing, really. I mean, no. You have a little bit over at Fleet Farm, but if you know if you want something maybe a little nicer, you you actually gotta go to Appleton or Stevens Point or something. 
Well, when we had another child get married, we went out to uh, the, what is that store where the food pantry is now? Uh, what was that called? They was had it called fabric. Family yeah. Yeah, that's it. They had fabric, yarn you could buy. And that's why people are doing it on internet. We have a knitting class that I'm in. And you can't buy anything like that in Wapaka, but we had to go there to buy another suit for my husband. He changed sizes again by the time the other kid got married. Okay, we had to have another suit. And dad didn't know, no, what are we going to do? This one doesn't fit. So we went out to the store on the corner there, across from where is now the cleaners and well, the laundromat is mm -hmm. there, not the cleaners anymore. And we went in there and she fitted him with a jacket and a pair of pants for this oncoming wedding. Yep. And now we do not have a cleaners in town. You take your clothes to Piggly Weekly and they hang them up and along comes a truck and picks up your clothes and takes them to the cleaners in another yeah. town. <laughs> you were also going to talk just a little bit about... Um, the dedication when Roy Holly had the oh the rededication of the library building. Um, Mr. Holly had aspirations and was helping us uh, buy get it. into yeah. buy the building and get into the historical society. And um, he he what he was going to do this. So the day was set and we were going to have the rededication of the building. And uh, a lot of us were there. And I introduced Mr. Holly, and then he did the rededication of the former library and former restaurant and whatever else was in the building. And he uh, welcomed it to be the Holly Center. And, and his wife was there. Yeah, Cynthia. Cynthia there. Holly was there. And a lot of other people. We have a picture of that in the um, Holly Center of them There's a rededicating the building. There's a portrait of Cynthia, well done by <clears throat> Doris Weed, downstairs. In the lower quarters. called, he renamed it the Cynthia Holly Room. It yeah. also had many names. Yeah. You know, every, like every 25 years, different buildings will get renamed. And some of the rooms inside will be renamed because I remember some other names that they had. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you know, about 25 years later, somebody has some money and fixes up the room and it is called something else. And they're going to remodel again. Yeah, We're they're going to get the downstairs part with um, loop for hearing. Yes. Because we have a lot of elderly people who come in and go to our programs. We can hold as many, I think, as 70 people in that downstairs of the Holly Center. Yep. And well, so it, it, it needs to be redone. I mean, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. it's like it's they got that not... nicotine yellow walls. Yeah, and so they're going to put the hearing loop that many of our churches have, you know, on, under the carpet or under the linoleum, they call it the hearing loop. And if you sit there and you have your hearing aid, it works better to hear the minister or in our case, it will be to hear some lectures that are being done by people that come to tell us about Whispering Pines program, what they're doing out there, uh, how it was years ago. It's hard to hear in an older building. The acoustics aren't set right. How old is the Holly Center? Do you have any idea? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it would be like 19 something right after the turn of the century. 1905 maybe for the Carnegie yeah. for the building itself yeah, yeah. so like it's a uh, lot of money yeah it's a lot it's a lot younger than the rest of the town <laughs> so, right I mean for the most part and the buildings down where I'm at man I, I some of those were pre-1900 uh-huh like the Holly Center that roof has been leaking for years and years uh, different pots had to be put on on the first floor or the the workers there would get wet and this is the first time that any of roof. us know about a new roof has finally been put on after all these yeah. years, they would patch and patch and fix and move the uh, pots around the first floor well, 
you know, that's why we're, you know, kind of adamant about this capital campaign, because I, I think people really need to realize, and I understand because everybody's always wanting money for what, one project or another, but right. or one charity or another. But I, I really do, deep down, I do believe we, we definitely need to try and preserve history the best we can. And we really need to get caught up with the tech as well, you know, digitize everything. We really need to do that. Um, we, we need to, you know, we need to fix what we have too. We can't just keep putting band aids on things. So, right. Uh, I think they need they need help. If there's people out there to help Tracy do the accessioning, um, I don't know what kind of background people need. I know she always says I can help train you, but that's another job for her to do. Then you know, and she spread so thin with with her work, but accessioning is important because if you get something, you want to know the history and where are we going to put this and where are we going to save it? And, and, and what's the, the digitalized story going to be? Who can do all of that to put the stuff in the right places and to save it? Uh, if it's, if it's Wapaka history, a lot of things that people bring in is not Wapaka history. It's kind of hard to, save everything you can't so we need people she often gets young people to come in but they don't stay very long you know they help for a couple of months and then they're off to some other that, yeah. that's that's a thing where the where you need a lot of help to get get this stuff on the computer who brought it in how old is it what was it used for the accessioning of any article takes a lot of work for one article. And you see how many articles are in on the first floor <laughs> waiting to well, be accessioned. Well, well over a you know a hundred years of history, well over it. You know, right. that's just in newspaper articles and not to mention all the all the items that need to be preserved and not just putting some, you know. Uh, damp, musty storage unit somewhere. Right. You want if it belonged to like if it looked good and it could be in the Hutchison house first. You have to do all that accessioning and get the paperwork or the computer work done before you really can put it out to the King's Cottage or out to the the depot. You know, all that has to be done and it's being held at the Holly Center while the proper persons can do that work. It's a lot of work to do all that accessioning and beside that, the storing of it. That's another project. There is something I would like to do to end the uh, episode, but first I'll ask dad, do you have any questions for Marge and Betty that you would like to ask them? Uh, and I'm, I'm in desperate need of another cup of coffee. So I need to do that. Um, <laughs> and we want to invite everybody to come and see some of these things that I don't know what's in that building. Come out and find out what's in the building. Come out and find out what some of the clubs do. You know, you're bored staying home. You're sick of it after COVID. Come on out and see what, what's being done in town. I would like to, yeah, touch on the Historical Society a little bit more too, because I think there's a, a misconception that it's just the Holly Center. Uh -huh. But no, the, the Historical Society encompasses the depot, which is really cool. And hats off to Mike. I mean, he's done an amazing job out there. He oh, really yes. has. And then the Hutchinson uh, House. And then, uh, as you mentioned, the, the King Cottage. Uh, I mean, these are, that's what it encompasses. It's not just, you know, the Holly Center. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's kind of its main office, but and one big part of the Holly Center is all the genealogy. Yeah. When they answer the phone, they say it's the genealogy and history center. Right. Mm -hmm. so and maybe you have things you want to find out about. You don't have to go on internet alone. Um, genealogy group is happy to help you with cemeteries and uh, weddings that were held in Wapaka, funerals that were held in Wapaka. We have books on all of that. Yeah, it's all categorized. If you come in with some names, these things can be found for you. You don't have yeah. to do it alone. We forgot to mention that we also have the fourth graders come to the Hutchison House 
during their history part of school. At least we catch them in fourth grade. And some of them, I had one come in, he was an adult man, and he remembered his fourth grade tour in the Hutchison wow. house wow. when they were doing some history. It isn't often that you find somebody coming back, but he was here to do something in Fallorama. And he remembered coming in as a fourth grader. Wow. And every year, That's pretty good. all the classes in fourth grade do come into they, the Hutchison house. They study the state of Wisconsin in fourth grade. And so then that's how they bring them over by us. And this year, they're going to do it in the spring. Yes, we the usually... teachers come, the bus driver brings them. It's a class. Yeah, I remember doing that. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. And we hope to keep them later, too. We don't want them to just come once in fourth grade, come and see something else later again. When you're in your 20s that you barely could remember and it's still being preserved for you to see again quick thing i want to do before we end here i have some rapid fire questions so if you could answer real quick short and sweet that would be great it's just some things that i think it'd be very interesting especially for someone my age and younger people to know and uh, all three of you, including dad, feel free to answer as well. First off, were you here before Fulton Street was as busy as it was in Wapaka? Were you here when it was farm fields? Yes. No, I was not. Okay. And then... Were you in the 60s? They didn't have left and right. They didn't have all the shops and all the stores left and right on Fulton. Well, so I don't you were here in the 60s. I was here in the 60s, but we didn't come to town much. We were really farming. <laughs> okay. Came in for church but and I, then I picked up a few things at the grocery store. I didn't spend time in town. Didn't have time. I remember a farm being the Loberg farm on the right-hand side. And then nothing was down the, there was nothing either side when I first came here on Fulton past, say, up Hillcrest. And there was a where Dairy Queen, not Dairy Queen, where Burger King is. Past, oh, yeah, nothing past was. that, nothing. No, that's why the woods is called the woods. The restaurant was way out there. It was woods. There were yeah. no stores, no anything out there. Well, next question, what is the best restaurant you have ever eaten at in Wapaka? Ever. It can be places that are closed or open, doesn't matter. The Oakwood. King's Table. And King. Mm. It's kind of a toss-up depending on what I'm feeling like. But I mean, I like Simpsons and I, I, I like T-dubs and, of course, Gretchen's. Right. Gretchen's, I would say Gretchen's is my, my favorite, but um, yeah, I think so too. If but... I'm wanting to go for a steak or something uh, a little, uh, I guess I don't want to say fancy, but I mean, Gretchen's is a really nice diner. So, mm -hmm. but you don't yeah. even remember the word Oakwood if you're new to town. But my husband never went to Simpsons. He always went to the Oakwood. It was kind of casual dress when you went in, but you could order the nicest steak or anything else that's where he liked to go to eat i'm surprised none of us didn't say taco bell no <laughs> <laughs> i like it now <laughs> <laughs> if there's one place that is now no longer in wapaka or one event that you missed the most in wapaka what would it be uh christmas parade classic christmas I still go to the 4th of July parade. I don't know why. I feel like I've seen it all already. But it's one of those things you have to go because you see some people that you haven't seen for a long time. It's the people that you see up and down the street. Mm -hmm. I guess that's fun. The 4th of July parade. 4th of July is my favorite holiday. and I. But it's remained you know, good. They always have a big parade, but I think it's the horses. They don't have as much of oh, those. Yeah. Um, 
And then I have a couple questions that aren't necessarily Wapaka related. Uh, who is the most famous person you have ever met? Most famous. I can go first. This person has been on PBS and uh, she's related to me. And we've talked about it in our family, how much um, she did with her life. She had a program, it was a sewing program called Sewing with Nancy. And oh, yeah. someone in our family had to do a paper one year or two about naming a famous person. And they said, well, Nancy, you know, she's, she's had her program on for years and she's um, third cousin to me, but it's not like, you know, I've met any movie stars or I, I think of either. anybody I've met. I shook the hand that took the hand maybe of some presidential candidates, but we used to do that, you know, in high school, if you had a visitor politically or something, and then I shook his hand. Well, then I shook the hand that shook the hand. Oh. <laughs> I can't think of anyone <laughs> but spontaneous I, that I recall. I've met John Mellencamp. Uh, his name left me, that's terrible. Huey Lewis, um, Kenny Arnoff. He's a drummer. I mean, he's been at the Kennedy Center Honors, stuff like that. Um, Gerald Ford, when he was president, I actually got to shake his hand. I have a picture. I showed it to Joe one time, and he was like, is that Air Force One? You know? Uh, I'm like, yeah. So uh, Maybe I'm going to meet somebody. I can't think of anybody. Maybe I'll have to meet somebody, really. <laughs> yeah, honestly, a lot of this stuff was just kind of I just random. have it, I guess. I, you know, running into like Huey Lewis at a health food store in Montana. I mean, it was just so random. Um, uh, I don't know. Willie Nelson. Oh, That's a, that was another real oh, wow. good one. Too. Yeah. Did you meet yeah. Larry Bird? Yeah, Larry Bird. Basketball player. Oh. Yeah. Bob Knight, Bobby Knight, of course. Um, Basketball player. Yeah, I mean, all Indiana people, but yeah, Larry Bird, I, I ran into him. I mean, I was fishing at a lake called Lake Batoka in Indiana. And this guy pulls up, you know, he's, he's drinking a couple of beers and stuff and came out to fish and it was Larry Bird. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. You know, that was the same instance with uh, Willie Nelson too. It was a fishing thing. I just kind of ran into him. So, uh, See? See? yeah. I want yeah. my name Willie well, Nelson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind Maybe of my day is coming yet, right? But, well, John Mellencamp <laughs> lives this. in Bloomington, Indiana, and that's you know where I, I, I lived for quite some time. So I, don't know, well, I think uh, about people I'd like to meet. I think would be interesting, like like John Oliver, because he's kind of you know kind of weird looking. I think it'd be kind of neat to see him in person to see if he's actually that weird looking, or if it's <laughs> <laughs> no offense, John. It's just just a sad ploy to try to get you on our podcast sometime get your attention but. i think for me well i was there with you for huey lewis at the health food mm -hmm. store and i was i didn't know who huey lewis was because i was too young to know uh at the time but uh i i know a lot more of him now and i i wish i uh was a little older when that happened because i would have known who that was but i've been on I've been on Zoom calls with some famous people during the pandemic. Uh, Bob Iger, the Disney yeah. uh, CEO for many years. He's one of only four CEOs of Disney ever. That and, was cool. I was, I, uh, was, I was there with you. Yeah. That was cool. And then David Muir, the oh, wow. ABC World News ah, uh, really? anchor. Uh, yeah, both of those guys are real, real passionate about what they do, and it was mm. really cool getting to hear what they had to say. Well, I heard Esther Williams came to the island across from King Veterans Home. I never saw her in Wapaka, never got to see her, but she was here. Oh, well, and, and gone. <laughs> well, Joe, we saw like Donald Driver and Greg. Uh... Oh, Sorry, what was Jennings? yeah? Yeah. Uh, so we saw Donald Driver, Greg Jennings, and then Mike and Mike from ESPN. 
Mike Greenberg and Mike mm-hmm. Rollick, uh, because they're all at Disney. Uh, so we and those ESPN Wide World of Sports. So we saw them, and and then I've also uh, gotten to be uh, on a Zoom call with Dan O'Shannon, who's a really famous comedy writer. He's won many Emmys. He's helped with Modern Family, New Heart, uh, Cheers, Frasier. Uh, he's he's had a really long, successful career. So that was cool, too. Did anybody see Butler? Now, he was a famous no. player and right no. here in Wapaka for a while, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I never met him. There's that young guy, Joe, who did the, I always forget, and I apologize to him. I, his name I just left my head. Uh that came to the band concert because you guys were doing his music. The guy. Yep. That was a uh, Justin Hurwitz. Yes. And uh, probably the best film composer right now, especially the best one under 40. Uh, and in my opinion, and he has done the music for Whiplash, which might be the best music related film of all time. And then La La Land, which is one of the best current musicals ever. Oh, that, yeah. And then First Man, he also did. And he is going to be doing the music in Babylon, which is coming out uh, this holiday season, I think a little after Christmas, uh, early January. Oh. And that film could be winning Best Picture. That, that, that's, that has some big Oscar hype around it. Uh, so make sure to support him and see Babylon in the theaters yeah I thought that was pretty cool because uh, I think it was weather related that day we ended up in the high school didn't we? for the band yeah the city band and they were playing his music and and he was in Wapaka and just showed up I mean one of the most famous composers of our modern time in my opinion mm-hmm. so I suppose Babylon will be something like Green Bay the Rush Theater or something It'll come there. Well, hopefully it'll oh. come. I mean, it's a music. It's a movie. Yeah, we're in need of a theater. We're in need of a big well, theater. Maybe ours will open in spring. They say. I don't know. Mm. Because a lot of ladies go out of town to go to a movie. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time since they had anything it's here. Packed. It would be nice if the if our if the Rosa would open back up. It's just good. are they three? Yeah. Are they three screens or mm-hmm. I don't remember. Four. four. Okay, really? four. Okay. <clears throat> but they haven't been open for years now. Well, since the pandemic, they shut right. down and they just have never reopened yet. No. Uh, who owns them, Joe? It's not Rogers. Marcus. Rogers right. Cinema. And then Marcus Theaters is in Appleton, but Rogers Theaters or Rogers Cinema also has uh, theaters in Stevens Point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people are going out of town to go to the theater. That I yeah. heard. <laughs> well, I miss it. I, I I like the convenience of it, and I like the, you know, it, it's just an it's an old building with, mm-hmm. you know, it's the history there again. Thank you, Marge and Betty, for being on today's episode of Pod Packa. Uh, we really appreciate all the knowledge and life experience that you have shared with all of us. And make sure everybody to, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, to subscribe to our channel. And also, if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, make sure that you follow us and check out all our other episodes that you may have missed. And until next time, uh, with Marge and Betty and uh, here with my co-host and dad, Tim Drake, uh, I'm Joe Drake, and thank you for listening to Podpack. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy your weekend, ladies. It was a pleasure having you. You too. You too.